So I want to begin by teaching you a word that you've never heard and never used. I want to ask for the show of hands. Who knows what the word diffident means? To be diffident, or the noun diffidence, D-I-F-F-I-D-E-N-C-E. Know what it means? No, no fair. No fair anybody with who's, who's been in other schools. Huh? <laughs> Those who, <laughs> I'll give you a brief definition. Diffidence is where you believe yourself to be wrong even when you're right. Diffidence is an attitude that even when you're right, you're wrong. Can you understand that? Would to God that that were a conspicuous trait of the church rather than this bumptious conceit when we're right, we're wrong when we're right, if that's our, the attitude with which we express it. But to be right and see yourself as wrong is pleasing in the Lord's sight. That's humility. That's diffidence. That's gracious, allowing that however persuaded you are, you're willing you to consider that you might well be wrong, even though you're right. And even though you prayed and fasted, there's no guarantee that what you're going to speak or do is sanctioned or given of God. I know because I've tried to twist God's arm by fasting yeah. as if to persuade him to confirm what I think I need to say or do. So um, file that word and rehearse it and consider it and uh, ask the Lord to give you the grace to be diffident. That even when you're persuaded you're right, you also acknowledge that you're wrong. That's, that's appropriate to our humanity. And ironically, the subject this morning is the mystery of incarnation. The issue of Jesus being both God and man. The Council of Chalcedon, do I pr pronounce it correctly, Roach? Mm -hmm. About 400 Chalcedon. AD? Chalcedon. Had to wrestle through the issue of how could Jesus be both man and God? If he was not man, if you, um, if you deny his manhood, you take away from God the sacrifice and the servant and the suffering servant and the priestliness and the identification that Jesus has with his people in his humanity. But if you take away his deity, then he's only merely man. How could God allow himself to be crucified? Can God die at the cross? These were staggering questions that were coming to the church as a great challenge and threat of heresy. Those who denied the humanity of God, I think they were called the DOC Docetists. Docetism. And those who denied the, the uh, divinity of Christ were guilty of the other side of the same coin. Huh? The Arians. Arians. So there was a remarkable thing that threatened the church in its early history. And so the great church councils, Council of Nicaea that preceded it, the Council of Chalcedon defined and wrestled through these questions. They gathered up the theologians and churchmen of that time and heard them out and debated and finally came up with a statement that a lot of which is uh, expressed now in the confession. What do we call it? The apostolic, the Apostles' Creed. The Creed is the summation of the findings of many of these church councils. And the phrase, very God, very man, comes out of the Council of Chalcedon. That he, Jesus was both very God and very man. Well, who has ever heard of, of that? It's unprecedented. History has never provided an example of God and man in the same person. How important is that? Could the messianic ministry of Jesus be fulfilled if he were not a man? Could it have been valid if he were not God? if he were only man. And so how can both function in the same personality at the same time is a staggering conundrum, not only about Jesus, but about ourselves. Because the issue of incarnation is the issue still. What do we say? Christ in us, the hope of glory? If Christ is in us, 
That's deity. And us is humanity. So we are faced with the same essential issue in our own walk as is represented by Jesus in his. And is that not the reason why he's called the pattern son? That he has gone before us to show us that there's a way in which deity and humanity can be in union. And in fact, if they are not, then there's no true manhood. It takes God to be a man. Not just by shoring us up, by, but by infusing us with those divine qualities that bring us to a full humanity. That man without God is bestial. We've seen that in our modern history. The most celebrated of civilizations was reduced to bestiality with, without pity. And we're told in the last days, a whole generation is being raised up without natural affection, without, uh, how does it say, without gratitude, um, disrespectful to parents, ungodly, um, seek lovers of self rather than lovers of God, without natural affection, without the capacity for pity or, or, or compassion, cruel. They, they have lost the, their human distinctive. And the remarkable thing is when man loses his human distinctive, he sinks below the level of an animal. He performs those things for which we would never expect an animal to perform, and they don't. But man, robbed of his humanity, becomes a grotesque, becomes less than a beast. And to what degree then does manhood, real manhood, require divinity? Can you be a man without God? I'm not talking about just wearing pants. What, what does man mean and to be human? What other qualities? And how are they to be obtained? How, how can God transmute what he is in himself into a, an earthen vessel? And is that unbecoming to God? Is that an appropriate uh, vessel for him to be confined to a, natural, to a human body? And that we say Christ in us. For, for me to live as Christ, Paul said. Is he just a woofing? Is he just mouthing a phrase? Or is he speaking about the, the uttermost distinctive that explains Paul as Paul, as the apostle? If for him not to live as Christ would be not to have an apostle. Because the chief apostle of our confession is Jesus himself. So you can't tell where Paul ends and God begins. There's a remarkable union. And can you tell in the history of Jesus what issued from his humanity and what issued from his deity? When he said this or he said that or did this, from what source was he drawing? If, of course, if he's only exercising his deity, we can admire that conduct and those miracles and the great wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount. But, of course, we could never hope to emulate or aspire to that standard. He has an advantage over us. He's both God and man, and that's God speaking. Of course, what do you expect? Who else can give the Sermon on the Mount? But, and if, he lay aside his deity and is speaking out of his humanity, that opens questions of, an, of another kind entirely. If he has laid aside his deity, and everything that he's performing is by faith, and trust in the Father, who imparts to him spirit, words, and guidance, then we are in a position relative to his. What, what do we lack that is not available to us of the inspiration of God, his spirit, his example, his leadership, his guidance? What prevents us from being perfected in our humanity and acting and completing the messianic tasks that remain in the same way by which Jesus himself performed it? Don't think that the issue is over. It's still a very live issue. Uh, John Murray the reform theologian from whom I quoted in the first week of the school, is dead against believing that Jesus forsook his deity. 
because God cannot cease from being God. So how can, how can he lay aside his deity? Therefore, his wonders and miracles can only be understood on the basis of that power uniquely his as being God as well as man. But let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 2 in the classic text that speaks about laying aside Philippians, what did I say? Oh, I meant Philippians. I'm reading from the uh, Phillips edition that came out some years ago. J.B. Phillips, Letters to the Young Churches, a kind of um, paraphrasing of the scriptures in contemporary English. And sometimes when you hear it that way, you catch it in a way that is unfamiliar and penetrates the more deeply. My translation adds a significant phrase. And having become man, he humbled himself by living a life of utter obedience, even to the extent of dying. And the death he died was the death of a common criminal. And having become man, he humbled himself. Let me read the whole Phillips translation of that statement. Let Christ himself be your example as to what your attitude should be. See, so why are we taking up the subject? Is it just historical curiosity? Or we want to learn of the early controversies of the church that were resolved in the great church crises and uh, councils? Or is there still an issue? And how does it pertain to us? It makes a world of difference if Jesus had an advantage over us that we can't employ. And God cannot have an expectation that we should walk as he walked. But if he walked in his humanity, then God has every right to expect a comparable kind of walk from us. So we have to wrestle through this question for its remarkable implications. And so here's Paul exhorting the church. Let Christ himself be your example as to what your attitude should be. For he, who had always been God by nature, did not cling to his prerogatives as God or as God's equal, but stripped himself of all privileges. Some, I think some of your translations will say he emptied himself. How many, how many, how many raise your hand if yours your says he, he emptied himself. Does anybody have some other word rather than strip or empty in their version. I kind of prefer stripped or emptied because it's a very graphic picture of a man who had every right in his deity to have certain things intrinsic to his life, but voided them and emptied himself. Uh, another author who I'll be bringing to our table next week, P.T. Forsythe, said, that's the very evidence of God. Only God would have the power to empty himself of his godness. See what I mean? A man could not do that. But God can do that. And that he did do it in order to perform something of a kind that would have a lasting significance into the very present day, into the end of the age. This is humility. You know, it's humility for God to take the form of a man. Uh, are you humbled by being a man? How many times do you have to go to the boys' room? And when you reach my age, even having gone, you still continue to dribble. Excuse, excuse the, uh, the reality. It's embarrassing. Would to God we had a glorified body already where the valve shuts off when it should. <laughs> a body is an embarrassment. Paul could hardly bear it. He wanted to shock off and, and be clothed upon with a heavenly tent. He was tired of the infirmity of the body and its restrictions, its demands. It's got to be fed and attended. And often it's in conflict with the things that are spiritual. It's attention. God submitted himself to that. We don't appreciate the cross until we understand that in order for the cross to have its work, God had to come in the form of a man and had to empty himself of his divine prerogatives and privileges, even of his power, in order to suffer what could only be inflicted upon him in the weakness of a man. Elsewhere it says he was crucified in weakness. How can God be weak? 
unless he has forfeited his strength. And that he would do it for us is a remarkable statement of God. That's why the cross is the revelation of the righteousness of God. Because he emptied himself. He, even coming down from heaven, the pre-incarnate life of Christ is a neglected subject of the church. We think that he began with Mary. No, he had an eternal existence with the Father long before he took upon himself human form. And to forfeit that long experience and come down into the earth and come out as a baby dependent upon parents, holy, weak, and, and all of the things which children are totally dependent is an unbelievable humility for God himself to perform. Right. But the benefits of his godness, yeah. that he, he emptied himself, so that he'd be wholly cast upon the Father for every provision to fulfill his earthly call. He would have to be a man of the Spirit. He'd have to be a man of faith. He would have to pray. He would have to go through the tensions and struggles that we do, discerning, is it God or is it me, of the kind that we ex experienced this morning. That's a tension, that's a conflict, that's a humiliation. When you lay aside divine prerogative that would always be absolutely perfect and act out of a humanity that is variable and, and uh, questionable and frail, that you never know with certainty, and yet he had to perform certain things with utter exactitude, overturning the money changes tables. That word to that, uh, the Gentile woman about crumbs from off the Lord's table, there were significant moments. Every moment in the life of Jesus is significant. What he said and did in any moment can make or break his messianic claim. As, for yeah. example, Amen. he went to his death as a lamb to the slaughter silently. If he but what said one thing, if he allowed his human irritation to be vexed by being mocked by his people in his suffering when you're most vulnerable, the whole testimony written seven centuries before in Isaiah would be invalidated and his claim as Messiah would be negated. If he had said one word, he went to his death silently. He had something to fulfill, and he fulfilled it perfectly. But if he did all that in his humanity, what a remarkable testimony to the relationship that he had with the Father, to his own dependence and trust of the Father, even for his own resurrection, that he had to live by faith, that he had to be up early praying to, to, to catch the sense of the Father's heart and to trust for the enablement to, to walk as he was required to walk. These are all issues for us that... Uh, for which reason we're taking it up. So he emptied himself of all privilege by consenting not only to be a man, we need to ask the question, when the devils were obedient unto him, have you come before the time uh, when he was able to cast out that which his disciples could not cast out, was he then employing his deity and its authority or did he come to an appropriation of an authority with God by his walk that was effective in casting out those demons? Got the idea? The latter. Because you remember when the woman with the issue of blood walked behind him and she had not been able to find a solution with doctors and her whole substance and fortune was spent in vain? If I could but touch his garment, she said, I'll be healed. And he was in the press of a crowd, and she touched his garment and was healed. But he knew in that moment, someone touched me. They said, what are you talking about? There are people crowding all over. But he said, I felt the virtue go out from me. That virtue was the healing power of God. But if it, if it was God, how could it go out? It would always be constant. God cannot be subtracted from God. But if it was something cumulative, and I'm raising this as a question, not as a thus saith the Lord, that he obtained by successive obediences so that what we call virtue is the residue of God that, it, that 
exists as authority by, by, in light of your history of faithfulness. That when she touched him, that's the power that went out from him. It was a residue of, of what re one receives in obedience. Well, how do you mean that, Cass? Because it says the Holy Spirit is given to them that obey him. Why? Because we need the power for obedience. God never calls us to an obedience that we can perform out of ourselves. Look, man, no hands. Every obedience which God calls us is beyond our human ability. And therefore, we're, we're cast upon God, and in our son's determination to honor God by obeying, he grants his spirit. And so I'm raising the question that when the spirit is given in obedience, what else comes with the spirit that is retained even after the power of the spirit has been expended in the obedience. But uh, there are thought, these are thoughts we need to consider. That something remains because the Spirit of God is not just an abstract energy. The Spirit of God is God. It's the Ruach HaKodesh. It's the Spirit of Holiness, which is to say the moral character of God is imbued in the Spirit. So when He extends His Spirit for an obedience, it performs it, but the, the reality, the character of what came remains. And, and so successive obediences mm -hmm. form something of a cumulative kind that Jesus felt went out from him when she touched him. And the early English language, in some Bibles they don't even say virtue, but in some of the others it's a, a virtue went out from him. Well, I love the word virtue. Well, you know the kind of guy I am. I like the word diffident. I like the word virtue. I like all words that have moral connotations. I even like the word moral. Because if you take the word moral out of our vocabulary, out of our speech, out of our consciousness, and out of our conduct, we are no longer man. We're an animal. That's exactly what makes man man, is the moral quotient. No other creature, no other animal thinks in moral terms or acts morally. It's our privilege. And it's the distinction that makes us human is our moral consideration. So I'm saying that virtue has a moral ring to it. Virtue is, is more than just abstract power. Virtue is character. Something that Jesus had not by virtue of his deity, but by virtue of his obedience as a son in his humanity. Dum -da -dum -dum. That's the point. Well, what's the point, Katz? That if he had a virtue that could be tapped as power, not because of his deity, but because of his obedient humanity, what, therefore, is, are we capable of having by our obedience? I would prefer to think that power should be related to character and not just be an entity unto itself that anyone can perform independent of what they really are and their moral character before God. Because charismatically, that's exactly what we have been seeing in modern times. The men of faith and power. But their lifestyle is, not, is hardly moral. They're living like barons and mansions and private jets and all, the, all that kind of stuff. So contrary to the poverty of Paul and of Jesus himself. It raises significant questions, and yet they seem to e express power. So many have heard this from me before. One of my most agonizing moments in my own history, in a platform at Jerusalem in the 1970s, with a lady then who was the most famed evangelist of her generation, that brought her catches with her, men who caught the bodies that fell, and uh, the excitement when she reached behind the person being prayed for to touch the catcher, and the catcher went down. And the flashbulbs were popping in the excitement, and I'm standing four or five feet away from this action, uh, out of my skull. I, I'm anguishing in my soul at the visible evidence of power, bodies going down, and the complete absence of any sense of God's presence. The failure... The, the power without a sense of God, that country, I, I, I took Inga by the hand, 
And before 4,000 people, I yanked her. We were on the platform. Off the platform and out the building. I couldn't bear to remain a moment longer. So I much prefer power in conjunction with character. And I believe that's what Jesus exhibited, and that's what sons are called to exhibit also. Power that is independent of character seems like a formula for deception. And we have a power-hungry church that is not too scrupulous or concerned about what is the source of the power so long as they see the evidence of power. They want excitement. They want titillation. But they're not concerned with where it's coming from and through whom is it being expressed. I love, therefore, the episode of Jesus. Virtue has gone out from me. If it went out from you, dear Jesus, how did it come into you? If you lay aside your deity, your prerogatives, if you emptied yourself, if you did not exploit or employ your divine power, by what means then did it come into you as a man? Mm-hmm. These, this, this is why we're examining this subject. What's the implication for us? If Jesus did it all by his deity, well, we could admire that, but we couldn't hope to emulate that. And yet he's the pattern son bringing many sons to glory. And the word glory itself suggests God and his presence. Bringing sons to glory is bringing them to a place where they're in such union with the power of God as to demonstrate the glory of God, but not in any way to touch or misappropriate it for themselves. They can be trusted. If we are undiscerning, and are not careful to ascertain the source and the vessel through which it's coming, we will be treated to demonic deception. In fact, we're told lying signs and wonders characterize the last days. They are actual wonders, but they're lying because they do not come from the source of God himself, but his enemy, who appears to and presents himself as being from God. To the, to the dupes who just want to enjoy the exhilarating sense of power because they're bored. In fact, can God be witnessed to and his image be expressed except through a man? God has always required a tabernacle or a temple. It was filled with his glory. The priests could not minister. They had to come out. Because glory is diffused unless it's in a structure created for its purpose that is sanctified and cleansed that he might inhabit and possess it. That's why Jesus was so jealous with the money changers at the temple. They were corrupting the house of God. It's not a house that God could occupy, and in fact it's not long after that it's going to be actually destroyed, and not one stone would be left standing on the other. But the Jews died on the roof of the temple in 70 A.D., because they thought the building itself uh, could not be destroyed. It was God's temple. But he had vacated it. It was now an empty frame. And the same thing happens to us. If we are the temples of God in our bodies. But if we're not living in a way that's compatible with his holy presence, uh, we also will ex- uh, experience uh, being uh, vaca- vacated or forfeited. But he needs a temple. I said, God doesn't need anything but... In his own wisdom, his glory has got to fill the temple. To be seen, to be made manifest, it requires a vessel, whether it's a building or a human being. And so I'm saying all that to say this, that the greatest revelation of God as God must come through a man whose vessel is totally possessed by God and is wholly in obedience to that God. And in that obedience is expressing the very character of God. And that in fact, in laying aside his deity and his prerogatives, he's exhibiting God because God himself is humble. That when Jesus took that towel and girded himself and took off his robe and and drew water and washed the feet of his disciples, he was not just performing a novelty. He was enacting decisively a statement of what God is in himself in his character. God is humble, folks. He's so humble, he's willing to occupy us. What do you think of that? And so, how would we have known it 
if a man had not demonstrated it? See what I mean? And how shall the world know it if we don't demonstrate it? God doesn't need anything from man except that he himself humbles himself to require something for the showing forth of his own glory. He didn't need the world. He didn't need mankind. All of this is God acting out of his freedom as God. And what a revelation that is, that a God who is totally uh, entire in himself because he's perfect had no need of a world or, or universe or an earth or a humankind created it for fellowship, for relationship, uh, to show forth his greater glory, and the reasons that he has that are not even given us. He didn't have to. He's not under any compulsion. He's entirely free as God. He's voluntarily chose to create. In the beginning, God created. He was not under obligation. That he's willing to do that and take the risk of his creation that backfired on him, so to speak, through Adam and has generated generations of sinners who have mocked his name and blasphemed him and gave rise to a nation whose track record is altogether a pitiful thing as we read yesterday in Psalm 78. That, and that he foresaw and foreknew that this was going to cost him an anguish of soul and yet he, it did not deter him from creating and bringing Israel into existence as a nation for his name. Or well, the church. How has the church failed him? So he's a sufferer. Moral anguish may be the greatest form of suffering, even eclipsing the physical. God is a sufferer. God is humble. God is gracious and generous. He didn't have to share himself. He didn't have to create anything. He would still have been God and, and perfect and completed himself. Everything that he does exhibits him. And when he sends himself in his son, that very sending is the statement of God. Because Jesus was not conscripted. He voluntarily agreed with the Father. Because the Father and the Son are one. That there are purposes that need to be served in the earth that cannot be served by anyone else other than God himself. It's not enough for God to judge and let calves and bulls suffer the consequence. That's only a type to illustrate something that will come ultimately that eclipses the blood of calves and bulls. And that must be the blood of a man who is also God. If there's going to be blood, it's got to be a man. And a man, therefore, is free. A man acts voluntarily in agreement with the Father. He's not compelled. He exhibits what a man is in his own freedom in agreeing to serve the purposes of God the Father even at the expense of his own humiliation, suffering, and death. See, we can't celebrate the cross unless we configure the pre-incarnate history of Jesus with the Father before he came to the earth because he emptied himself of that relationship just to come. And in coming, he takes upon himself the form of a man. What a pitiful thing. With all of that limitation, hunger, thirst, fear, anxiety, opposition. Not only that, Paul tells us in Philippians, but the form of a Hebrew, the most despised race on the earth. He should have been a German at least, maybe. Or Denmark would have been second best. But a Jew becomes a Jew. And there are many Christians today who will not acknowledge that. And taking that, then he becomes a slave. What he did as a washing the feet was not a little flim flam. It was a statement of what he ever and always was, even before he came to the earth. That's right. He was always a servant because he reveals the Father. So the Father is a servant. Amen. The Father is humble. The Father is merciful. The Father is love. Because how do we know it? The Son exhibits and displays it all the more in his humanity he's not flashing his his credentials of deity that would only impress us but he's exhibiting it in his humanity for which we ourselves have the, the same prospect and that is altogether another story now we can become sons now becoming a son 
in the form of that son is ultimate honor to be conformed to the pattern of that son equally living sacrificially bearing suffering or reproach all the kinds of things that he bore in his humanity in order to show forth the glory of God the Father as servants what did it say in Psalm 102 when the set time to favor uh, Zion has come when my servants shall have compassion on her stones and pity on her dust it doesn't say church of course it couldn't have said church generations that would have been bewildered by the word but the word is significant servants when my servants servanthood is God it's not a, a, not a, a put on it's not a, a something that he was required to adopt it's what he was and is in himself because that's equally what the father is can you believe that the great God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that in them is is by very nature a servant that's his nature that by very nature he's humble that he's love that he's a sufferer for others here's what Karl Barth says on the subject of Jesus man for other men Jesus is the supreme man we don't know, we don't know what manhood is it's got nothing to do with biceps <laughs> or crushing empty beer cans in your bare hand or winning uh, tennis titles a man mama mia a man is a supreme statement have you ever drooled about it I'm not talking about some romantic image of but man what a creature made in God's image a man is a supreme accomplishment a man is a supreme piece of the ultimate expression of God in his creativity. God forbid we should allow that image to suffer loss and become a caricature or some drunken sot or some drug-afflicted uh, uh, character who can't even walk straight and mumble, mumble, can't speak a word straight or we're raising a whole generation who could hardly do anything but mumble, can't speak, their mind, their speech is not incisive. They, their minds are, are unclear. They're limited in their intention. Their ambitions are abysmal and low and carnal. They're, they are deformed in their humanity and are not reflecting the, the, the grandeur of God in creating us in his image as man. And you know what? Jesus in his eternal Identity retains his manhood. He didn't drop it off when he finished his functions in the earth and go back again to being an abstract entity as a son with the Father. At the throne now, he still retains his, his body. Amen. He still retains his manhood. And when he comes, he comes in that manhood. And we shall see him whom we have pierced. How come? Because his body bears the scars and will eternally Man is in heaven, you guys, at the very throne of God. That's a statement of God himself that he allows man to be in the eternal presence of God the Father. It's an honoring of man which puts a little obligation upon us to walk as men. Not as mere men, Paul says. Why do you walk as mere men? Which I spoke once in Denmark when they came into the building. I saw these guys coming in and I said, why do you walk as mere men? I, the meeting hadn't even begun yet. But the, when they came in, I was impressed. That's all they are, as mere men. There's something missing from their manhood, namely the divine quotient. They're just believers of a kind, but not of such a kind that their humanity reflects the deity of God. And until it becomes that, we're not really man. Man is not man without God. Man is man with God. That's what Jesus displayed, and that's what we are called to display. So listen to the statement from, from one of my favorite theologians. The humanity of Jesus is not merely the repetition and reflection of his divinity or of God's controlling will. It is the repetition and reflection of God himself. No more and no less. It is the image of God this is not some inadvertent thing. It's the very expression of God. Man 
and his perfected humanity in his obedience to God through the provision of the Holy Spirit, which is God, comes into a fullness that reveals God as God. That's what Jesus did. And that perfect piece of humanity was battered to a pulp and lost all of its shape. It had no, he had there no beauty that any should desire him. He was marred more than any man. They destroyed that humanity. But when God raised him up, we can see the other painting here. Every place where he suffered perforation in his flesh, beams of glory are pouring out. And when the disciples saw him in his glorified, resurrected body, they recognized him. Let me ask, when you receive your glorified body, see, you're not going to ever shut this off. You better learn to live with it. Without a body, you lose your, dis your human distinctive. We mustn't be contemptuous of the body, as if it's non-spiritual. The spiritual thing is made manifest through it. But we mustn't idolize it and pamper it, but respect it as a piece of God's creation and uniquely different with each one. So when, in the, when, we, when the Lord comes and we shall see him as he is, in a twinkling of an eye in a moment, we shall be made like him. We shall be given glorified bodies. What does that mean? We shall all be stamped off the same production line? We will be given a glorified body of the body that we brought as a seed into the earth. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, disputing with those who thought that the resurrection was past. But in verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and became the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. You know what I would do? I would take my red pen and circle the word man. Isn't that remarkable? In the morning the Lord says, develop a mistrust of man. Be suspicious of your own man. And yet God celebrates man. It's a paradox. For by man came death, but by man also came the resurrection from the dead. The supreme man, Jesus. The new creation. The new creation. The the template and the paradigm of manhood for all successive generations. Jesus is the paradigm of what manhood ought to be and will be in all successive generations. And our failure to conform to that image by sloth, by laziness, by indifference, by careless living, by sin, marring that image is... Uh, doing despite to the grace of God. We should be conformed to the image of the Son, the template of a perfect humanity in relationship with deity by faith. We also should exhibit and grow in that. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, verse 23, afterwards they that Christ that is coming, then comes the end when shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father when shall put down all authority. Well, he must reign, who has put all enemies on his feet. Now, in verse 35, some will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? They, do they come in some kind of magical, classic form, all stamped off the same production line? You fool, that which you sow is not made alive except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but a bare grain. It may chance wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it pleased them, and every seed its own body. What you sow will affect what you reap. What we sow as our body will affect the glorified form of that body. That's as much as I know and as I understand from these verses. But that we retain our humanity is clear. But in what form we retain it, has a lot to do in with what form it goes into the ground and dies. But we'll recognize each other. In what form will you see me in my 76th, 77th year, or the year of my death? Or will you see me at the flush of my youth, or at the height of my young manhood in my early 20s, or my, my, my mellow years through the 30s and 40s or 50s? In, in, in what age will you see me? Or, or each other? The scripture doesn't tell us but I suspect it will be the statement of the essence of what 
God has established and perfected through our earthly tenure will be the eternal statement in its glorified form. And you'll recognize, this is Reggie. That's art. We'll know each other because the essence of what we are and what we have allowed God to perfect and that, through our discipleship and consecration and even our suffering will eternally be, be carried in that glorified form. Wait till I read you. I have it in my briefcase now, but I don't think we're ready yet. Spurgeon's statement that when we have acquired the Son, we have acquired everything through which the Son has passed. His life experience, his maturity, the issues of his life are not just spent and done and fade with history. They are communicated in the Son perfected through that and when we acquire the Son, we acquire everything through which the Son has passed. And it opens to me some consideration like, how is it that Spurgeon, saved at the age of 15 or 16, is within a year already a preacher, and before he's 20 or so, he's preaching to thousands in London in a building that had to be made for him to accommodate the crowds. And when I read him even now, his insight, his knowledge... The, the, the knowledge of God, I can read you today, is you'll be floored. Where did he get that? Because he was already talking and writing like this in his 20s. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is his wisdom and knowledge of God could not have been the product of his experience. Uh, experience. He had not lived long enough. What then was he expressing? He was expressing the experience of the Jesus who was his life. Just to come consciously in an awareness like this and to receive the benefit of all through which Jesus has passed, that maturity is not just cumulative years. Maturity is receiving the tested son of obedience and make, making that incorporate and internalized and part of our own and walking in that. We're living beneath the glory, dear folks. We're living beneath our inheritance. The experience of Jesus is too precious to have been dissipated away after it was performed. It came into him as character, as moral being. The son being perfected through obedience through which he suffered should not be lost to successive generations, but be part of their inheritance. P.T. Forsyth says, Jesus became what he already was. Yeah. yeah. By his obediences, he came into his deity, so to speak, into the character of God, which he lay aside. He then obtained humanly by obedience. He became the God man, not by the supernatural thing that was his at the first, but by the acts of his humanity and obedience. So that the humility that he expresses is a divine character but it's yet attained humanly through his experience. Exactly. Now let me put this out. If we are at a place where we can consciously inherit the experience of Jesus and come into a maturity that is beyond our years, what happens to our experience? Huh? Are my 75, 6 years spent and gone and no one will receive the benefit and it's all dissipates with the air? Or if does the same principle pertain to us? That as the experience of Jesus is mediated and passed on through inheritance, as it were, the same thing is, is, is possible to us. That my children, not just biological, but spiritual, or the church, to whatever degree that it can draw from and receive, has the benefit of my experience, even that which is lost to my own memory, because it has settled somewhere in the being and in the person so that what is spoken and said carries a resonance and a weight of a history that you can inherit and preserve. And we can do that for each other. That the church ought to be one of the richest uh, realities in the world if we have the advantage of each other's history as well as his. And that it means that whatever suffering we're bearing is not just for the moment but for posterity. So that a future generation, should the Lord tarry, will receive the benefit of that through which we have passed. And therefore, we will have a greater disposition to bear that suffering 
if it has a significance beyond the moment Hallelujah. as it affects us, but will affect all the future as I believe it will, both in heaven and in earth. See the implications of this? Awesome. To know that this treasure is available and that we have been ignorant and have bypassed it, so to speak, and just acting out of the limitations of our own lifetime is a remarkable loss. So imagine the whole corporate body receiving this benefit and coming to that great maturity for which the Lord has invested himself. His investment is too great to be dissipated away and to be lost to successive generations or to the church in corporate, which the powers recognize. Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? What do they know about Jesus and Paul? And what could they know about Paul that they know equally about Jesus? Jesus they could know by virtue of his divinity as the sent son, but what could they know about Paul, who's a human being? But they know exactly the same for Paul as they know for Jesus. What, what do they know? That these men resonate God and resonate the authority of God, independent whether they were sent from the Father or they had a natural birth and were converted. But Paul's relationship with the Father through the Son was of a kind like the Son himself and brought dimensions into his life of authority that the powers recognized and feared. So when they mock us and they say, Jesus and I'm Paul, but who are you? They're saying, you lack what Paul exhibited. And Paul exhibited what Jesus exhibited, and both of them obtained it through from the Father, who is ultimate authority, not by virtue of birth, but by virtue of acquisition through obedience. So when we mock you, who are you that we should know? It was, it, those powers are saying, you guys are living beneath the standard. You're not living in a way as sons by which you would have acquired the same resonance of God as both Jesus and Paul exhibited, which we fear. Just to go back early in the life of Jesus, even as a boy, one of the first instances when he went up, they went up to the temple for the Passover and left in the crowd and thought Jesus was with them and found out after a few days that he was not and were panic stricken and they went back and they found him and he was both asking and hearing the doctors of the law I love that statement he was both speaking, raising questions but also hearing isn't that precious for a son uh, already exercising his humanity to obtain and uh, they said, where were you? And uh, they were flustered. And he said, don't you know how to be about my father's business? Already has this consciousness, even as a 12-year-old. And they understood not, it says in Luke chapter 2, verse 50, they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. The next verse says, and he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. This is a remarkable statement of the godly disposition already in Jesus as a son and as a boy that even though his parents did not understand him nor his call he submitted himself unto them to bear the the, what, the indignation the Reproach. irritation of parents who don't understand. Have you ever, ever had to bear the, uh, the humiliation of a wife who doesn't understand? Does it know what you're about? And why can't you tell jokes like other speakers? And why do you embarrass me with your strange behavior and yank me off the platform before 4,000 people in front of all those celebrities whom I admire and I want to bless? You're a strange man. Never understood you, even to this day. What does a man crave more in his humanity than that recognition? That's what Jesus suffered, the loss of, by parents who didn't understand him. But it did not hinder him from going down with them to Nazareth. And it's a literal going down, not just because Jerusalem is going up, but Nazareth is the, the anus of the world. It's the bottom of the pile. And Nazareth, can any good thing come out of it? So he's not, not only going with parents who... Uh, dum dums, but he's going down to a place that is spiritually despicable. He submitted himself. And the next verse says, 
and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Just the words, Jesus increased, indicates that this is not some full-blown deity that can be tapped at will, but that it is as human as, as us in the prospect of growing and increasing or falling back or being depleted. He increased in wisdom and in stature by God and men. And he never stopped increasing. He increased all the way through the 33 years of his life, right to the final obedience in the Garden of Gethsemane and to the cross. He kept increasing in stature. He grew into his full deity, so to speak, through his human submission and humiliation was the key to increase. If that was his mode of increase, what is ours? Dun, 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 dun. Why haven't we increased? Because we're unwilling to go down. We're unwilling to suffer indignity or lack of appreciation or understanding or whatever our Nazareth is and whatever our unbelieving parents or spouses are. There's plenty of opportunity if we will go down. And evidently, that's the mode by which Jesus increased in his humanity. And it's the mode for us as well. You see why it's so important to come to some understanding of this mystery of incarnation, of God in the flesh. There's got to be a flesh, there's got to be God. And there's a dynamic and a tension of, of relationship, of discerning and being obedient to that God, in which he'll allow you to trip and falter, just to show you how delicate a thing it is and that you, that you can't in the last analysis have an absolute confidence. Even if you have a 41-year history, the next time is as perilous and tremulous as the very first time you ever obeyed God. It never gets familiar. It's every time again as, as a first time of fear and trembling. And yet, when the hour strikes, you've got to go up. You've got to obey. You can't cop out and say, I, I'm not sure. You're as sure as you're sure, and even when you speak, you're diffident, because even if you're right, you're wrong. Got the idea, you guys? That sonship, Jesus demonstrated it. Why? So that we would have a pattern, as uh, Debbie said, a model. And Paul himself offered himself, follow me as I follow Christ. Take my example to yourself and my ways. It's not a man boasting in his vanity. It's a man who is the replica of Jesus and his generation. Jesus has not ended. He's continuing in counsel and messianic value through a son who has voided everything and counted it as done that he might win Christ. He's in the same relationship with the Father through Christ as Jesus was in his own body. That's why he can say, I don't receive this by, uh, how does he say it, by... I don't receive this as command. I, I offer you this as my opinion. And 2,000 years later, we are as fastidious and attended to what Paul gave as opinion as we do to what Paul received as commandment. That's how close the man was to God, that his opinion is not some chance uh, arbitrary thing, but has the same value as what he received as commandment because he was in that union with deity. We avail ourselves of what God makes available, but we have the same necessity to come to a wilderness place of radical separation from everything and to have that union with God by which we're instructed. Jesus had to have a 30-year history in his humanity before his three-year brief tenure and ministry. A 30-year investment for a three-year use. What about us and our generation? We go to a three-month discipleship school, and boom, we're in ministry. Where, where is our investment? Where are we willing to be hidden and obscure and, uh, and allow the Lord to instruct us in another kind of school before we ever take first steps in expressing ourselves? This is an instant generation, and everybody wants in three months to do, to do, and to be. That's why believers thought that I had died. Where, we haven't heard a thing about Art Katz. He was such a flash in the pan. This Jewish guy, he was soaring, and what a, what a spokesman, and anointed, and da-da-da. And we haven't heard of him 
Anybody know when did he die? Well, he was in the boondocks. Ten years out here without ministry. And even after the ten years, there are seasons in which God has shut me down for a year at a time. And there's no trip, no service, no ministry, no speaking. Fourteen months of sabbatical silence where I was not allowed to speak anything before the first message on the mystery of Israel in the church. So God has his ways of training us if we're willing to submit to death. Silence is death. The, the flesh yearns for activity. Why is it that when the priests were consecrated and after much blood and sprinkling and washings and all kinds of things, the last requirement for their ordination is seven days waiting at the tent of meeting, just twiddling their thumbs, doing nothing. And all Israel is looking on on that patent inactivity. Why? Because they're young. And there's an itch that needs yet to be brought into death and waiting is a form of dying. A priest that will not wait is not a priest. A priest who's impetuous and has got to say and do because the thought comes to him, it must be God, has not yet been tempered. So we're rushing such young men into ministry. Youth for Christ. Um, youth with a mission. My brother said, how can youth even have a mission? <laughs> you know, I admire... Uh, there's not an organization that I admire more, but their very title indicates the temper of our evangelical age. Youth with a mission. There's another. There's teenagers for Christ, and uh, because kids are bored and need something to do and go to exotic places, and uh, but how are they instructing others who have not been instructed themselves? How can they give beyond the, the level of their own experience and maturity? So it's a marvel, even you know, the good that has been done. And, of course, many come to maturity in the very process. But there's a tinge of presumption that youth can have, have a mission. Why, even the priests, the Aaronic priests, could not begin their ministries until the same age in which Jesus began his. Thirty. All those good years. Listen, at the age of twelve, he was stupefying the priests and, and the doctors of the law. He had such sagacity, means wisdom, and confounded them in the remarkable understanding, but he had yet to wait 18 more years before he could express it. I want to tell you, dear saints, that 18 years was death. Jesus didn't have to wait for the cross to experience death. His whole lifetime is a, an experience of death. Even going down with unbelieving parents to, to Nazareth is death. But those deaths were obediences that sprung to life. So even the Aaronic priesthood could not commence its, its activity till the age of 30, till the age of maturity. And after 20 years, they're finished. They retire at the age of 50. They gave the cream of their choicest years to their service. The 30 years that preceded were preparation for the 20 years of activity and then retirement. What a, what a mentality, so other than our own. We're doing, 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 doing. But it's sound and fury that signifies... Little, if, no, if nothing, as Shakespeare said. So God can give you a wilderness behind the shades and curtains of your own home. If you'll submit to it and welcome it. But there must be a wilderness. There must be a radical separation. There must be a dealing of God in which you shut out those things that are distractions. And uh, God can actually send you into a physical place. He brought us here. To know where Israel, the travel agents didn't even know where Laporte is. And uh, so hit the one way or the other, we've got to find our way back even to the pattern indicated by the Aaronic priesthood because even in the Melchizedek priesthood, it says that Jesus, being in the form of a son of God, was without father, mother, ancestry, beginning or ending of days. What does that mean? He separated from the most elementary, natural, soulish connections that, that are congruent to the life of men anywhere. Without father or mother, without ancestry, without beginning or ending of days. And what does it say? Uh, if he were in the earth, he would not be a priest at all. He was heavenly while in the earth. Paul's citizenship was in heaven while in the earth. Jesus could say to Nicodemus, uh, the son of man, no man ascends, no man descends, no man descends who has not first ascended 
even the Son of Man who is in heaven. Speaking of himself in Jerusalem, his feet on terra firma to a man in that same city, saying, the Son of Man who is in heaven. How can he be in heaven while he's speaking to Nicodemus on earth? If you don't understand that, you don't understand the subject at hand. You don't understand the mystery of incarnation. That you can be physically in one place, but the actuality that forms you, that governs you, that inspires you, that provides for you, is another place, and it's above, even while you're here below. And that this is God's normative intention for every saint. And Jesus demonstrated that. Paul demonstrated that. And we need to demonstrate that. Paul said, it's death that works in me, but life in you. There was a necessary season of death before the first expression of a holy message that has been withheld from the church until this, this time. The mystery of Israel and the church. The key of Paul's apostolic perception of the faith given at the heart of his book of Romans was lost to the church and to the best leaders in it. Men whom I knew and would confess uh, it's a complete mystery to me. I never have no understood it. So, where does God bring me in the, pl- the years in which he shuts down Ben Israel? To a Lutheran seminary in St. Paul. Liberal, 65% female student body, of which 99% were all witches or lesbians or both, hating my guts that when I took a visiting brother into school with me, into the classroom, he said, the moment you walked in, Art, I could feel the vibes coming out of these women against you. He said, the intense hatred against you. They were every day campaigning for my ejection because I had the audacity to say that God is he and him and and that the pronoun is masculine as against their belief that it was an earth goddess that precedes the Father. Oh, there was a tension every day. I came home every day from, from that school battered and bruised from the, the spiritual onslaught of these witches for two years. So, I mean, there's a whole history of... And in that time at the seminary, the Lord is beginning to open to me by inadvertent means, by a book that I stumble upon when I'm looking for another required reading on the history of Israel, of Jews in Germany, and begins to factor things into my comprehension So that by the end of the first quarter, the thought comes to me, what are the implications for the church of the last days? What are the implications for the church from the issue of Israel for the church of the last days? And I'm in my 14th month of a sabbatical silence, which, by the way, is not explained. When God requires the silence, now look, Art, I'm not allowing you to speak publicly for 14 months. You have no other source of income, by the way. And if you don't speak, who are you? You're a mouthpiece. And if you're, you're a dead man. You're, you're a piece of cadaver if you don't speak. But I'm not allowing you to speak publicly for 14 months. Well, he didn't even say how long. And he doesn't explain why. You just know the requirement. Did God say so? Well, not in so many words, but it was clear. But at the end of the 14 months at the school, I'm coming to the realization, he, the Lord has shown me something. And what are the implications for the church in the last days with regard to the subject of Israel? And boom, the phone goes off, and some guy whom I don't know from Sacramento art, my name is Pastor So-and-so, we're praying here. We believe God wants you to speak to us a seminar on Israel and the church in the last days. Boing! I knew that the silence was over. We're on holy ground, you dear guys, and we've not been on this ground before. This is a first... I'm li- I feel like I'm walking a tight wire with a great precipice below because, as Reggie knows, any undue emphasis of the one thing or the other can bring you into heresy by celebrating the, the humanity of Jesus uh, unduly or by celebrating the deity at the, at, to the disadvantage of this humanity can bring you into heresy. It's a remarkable walk, and yet if we forfeit the one or the other, we miss the great mystery that we are called to exhibit in our humanity. So, much prayer. That's why we fasted and prayed before the school began for several days, sensing that we were going to be called onto a new ground that we had never before explored. And we're on that ground right now.
that as Jesus now is eternally the man, Christ Jesus, at the throne of the Father, and will come again in his humanity and in his scarred body, we also will eternally live with and, uh, and continue in the humanity that is ours. That God is willing for that as a remarkable statement of himself. That he's not embarrassed or offended, that in fact he's glorified. Many sons being brought to glory through the sonship or the maturity in their humanity through the availability of God by faith in the spirit, through the reality of resurrection. It's a remarkable thing, but we have not been stupefied and stunned and in awe over our calling and uh, in our humanity. And humanity itself has been depreciated. Man is becoming a slop and a slur and a caricature. And, and the enemy loves to mar man. He loves to make masculine men effeminate and, take, and, ma and make women masculine. He wants to destroy the image of God. He wants to stultify and ruin and corrupt God, the image of man because the image of man is the reflection of God. And we need to contend against it. And that's why in Africa, the message to the church was stand for what God has made in his image. Don't allow these black people to be made merchandise and to be subject to disease and ignorance. Go and, and uh, present yourself before the legislature and demand those things that are minimal and essential to human dignity of man as man. Whatever the cost to yourself, you have to stand for what is made in man's image. That was the message. So it needs to be our message also, whether we're in Africa or not, and to esteem our own humanity as the vehicle for God's the revelation of his glory. So, Lord, precious God, oh, we're on new ground, my God. Yes. And somehow the morning prayer time has everything to do with the class time. It somehow fits. There's something here, the paradox of the, 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 to be suspicious of what is in man and the next breath to celebrate the humanity of man as the very vehicle for the revelation of God's glory. What a tension, what a contradiction, what a paradox is this faith. But we're not shunning it for that reason. We're embracing it for that reason. And we know we'll not come to that perfection of our humanity without a school of obedience, without a school of humility, without uh, dealings with God that we can't understand that perplex us, whether it's a long silence or uh, a rebuke publicly, that somehow it all fits in and is given and comes from the hand of God for the perfecting of sons in your image. So, Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. We're just feeling our way here. And we don't want to miss this remarkable issue that has come with the advent of your son and our call to these sons in his image. Thank you, my God, for bringing us this far. Open our understanding, our appreciation for ourselves in our humanity and not to despise it but to esteem it as given of God the Creator. And so we're blessed, Lord. Thank you, my God. Help us to continue today and in these days and bring us all the way through in the things that we've been saying to you again and again in prayer. Not just head knowledge, Lord, but life change. We thank you and give you praise for privileged time as this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.